Well, coming to you from the Toby Family Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club, it's Week to Week, the political roundtable for Wednesday, March 20th, 2019. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so this week, Republican Congressman Devin Nunez, he filed a $250 million lawsuit against Twitter, charging that the social media company censors conservatives and amplifies the voices of conservatives, uh, excuse me, of Democrats. And that argument has been debunked elsewhere, but in his suit, Newsom, excuse me, Nunez complains about fake accounts, such as one that it claims to be his mother, but clearly is not written by his mother, and another one called Devin Nunez's Cow. <laughs> <coughs> I mean, what you might guess is not probably written by his actual cow. Um, <laughs> but this Devin Nunez's Cow has apparently hurt the, rep the representative's feelings by writing that he's utterly worthless, <laughs> and it's pasture time to move him to prison. Oh. And true fact, Devin Nunez was a co-sponsor in 2017 of an actual House bill called the Discouraging Frivolous Lawsuits Act. So <laughs> I'm John Zipper, your frivolous host for the Week to Week Political <laughs> Roundtable. On today's program, we're going to talk about that college admissions scandal that everyone's talking about and a few people have profited from. Uh, we'll give a roundup of Trump news, where to get a good massage in Florida, some 2020 news, and we'll, of course, end the evening with our week-to-week -week news quiz. Uh, everyone's welcome at the Commonwealth Club. I don't care what your views are. I mean, I care about your views, but it doesn't matter what your views are. You're welcome here. But any opinions that are expressed up here are just those of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. A quick reminder, if you have a phone or a beeper or Devin Nunez's cow or anything that makes noise, <laughs> please silence it or put it on vibrate because we are recording this program. Now let's meet our panelists for tonight. I'll start at the far end of the stage. Carson Bruno is the Assistant Dean and Adjunct Lecturer at the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. He's on Twitter at Carson J.F. Bruno. So welcome back, Carson. Thank you. Thank you. Next to him is Melissa Kane, political and legal reporter for CBS Bay Area, that's KPIX. Melissa. <laughs> and next to me is Barbara Marshman, the former editorial page editor for the Mercury News. She's on Twitter at Barb Marshman, so welcome. But I'm, yep. I'm going to start an account that's John Zipperer's cow. I like it. <laughs> I'm from Wisconsin. We I'm all have those accounts. <laughs> yeah. uh, there are question cards spread throughout the room. You all know how to write down a question, send it up. Someone will collect them and give them to me, and I'll try to answer. Excuse me. I won't answer a single one of them. I'll ask them <laughs> as many questions as I can during the program. Now, let's start off talking about this university admission scandal where we all got the shocking news that rich people are gaming the system. Um, <laughs> A number of folks have been indicted for this college admissions scandal in which uh, students who students got admitted into some of these top flight universities by a number of things. It might have been having someone else take their uh, exams, it might have been having their exam answers changed, or my favorite is uh, them basically through bribing the sports officials um, getting in as a, an athlete of a sport that they didn't actually play. Um, so let's talk about this and uh, any political angle of this because uh, this has pretty much taken over a fair chunk of the news lately. Um, and by the way, I would like to say that I uh, am very proud that my parents paid to get me into the University of Wisconsin, but they did it by paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so Barbara, how important is this scandal? Well, it's important, but at, at the same time we have all this outrage going on Legacies have been part of college admissions forever. And, you know, and everybody knows if dad builds a building, you, the kid gets in. And if you went to Harvard, somebody told me yesterday that almost half of Harvard's class, average class, is legacy. I, I passed, it may be fake news, but, but apparently it is a large proportion. Wow, I didn't realize it was that big. I, well, it could be wrong. It could be wrong. Although, well... <laughs> Someone who should have known, or I wouldn't have. Um, somebody who went to Harvard. Um, and not my husband, who went to Harvard, but a long time ago. <laughs> Back when it was pure. <laughs> yes. So I, I, don't know how you, I don't know how you do something more than, I mean, this is already illegal. I don't know how you do something more without getting into legislating how money works in higher education. Well, presumably some of the lawsuits that are resulting may uh, 
end up getting some discovery, and then we will understand more about exactly how much of this is legacy. Yeah. But even if it's not legacy, like look at Jared Kushner, like his dad didn't go to Harvard. His dad just right. gave a lot of yeah. money to Harvard, and that really helped him get in. So I remember reading this and thinking, these guys just didn't go big enough. Like if you really want to get your kid in, right. <laughs> you, you give $3 million for, you know, a brand new chair of a certain department or something like that, and you can, and you can still, you know, really make sure. But they, they really want this certainty of, of, uh, of getting their kid in. And I remember first when I first heard about it, thinking, well, maybe these parents will just say, oh, I hired an overzealous consultant, yeah. and I, who knew they were going to go do crazy things. But wow, no, they are so busted. Like right. this, the tapes that they have of these people yeah. doing this are so incriminating. And the complaint, the very lengthy, like, 600 page complaint. I know it's hundreds of pages. Um, and I think it's done for the press. Like you don't need to include all this in a legal complaint. But I think they just wanted everyone to know like how crazy this is. And they have all these back and forths where there, there's the, um, the guy at the center of it who's like, who's like, let me explain to you how this works. And he explains it like great. He's like, all right, we're going to, he's going to meet a guy. You're going to give him an envelope full of money. He's going to meet the other guy. He's going to sit next to your kid and give him the good answers. And the president, and the, the parents like, okay, that sounds great. And you're like, oh, wow. You're so busted. So, uh, so they're in very, very big trouble. Now, Here's the other question, though. Now that we've got all this outrage over people who have tried to pay a bunch of money to break the rules, how much of a deal do you give these people, many of whom, or maybe all of whom, don't have prior criminal records? I think there's a lot of pressure on DAs and other law enforcement officials to really stick it to these guys because these are people who feel like if I pay a lot of money and have a great attorney, I can get something more lenient. So I think right now it's going to be interesting to see what happens both to the students at the schools and to uh, and people who've already graduated. Remember, the guy says, I've been doing this 24 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's, I've doing this is over 700 times I've done this. So we we only know like a very small part. Uh, so what happens to folks who've already gone and graduated? There's a lot of decisions that still have to be made, and and they're being made in a context of real outrage over people who try to game the system with money. So uh, that's what I'm looking for. Carson, hey. and we should point out Pepperdine University was not named. We were not, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Particularly the school I'm affiliated with, the School of Public Policy. So, um, whew, on that one. <laughs> but, you know, to that point, we, we can't let the schools off the hook here either. As someone who oversees an admissions department for, albeit a, a small graduate program, but still, it, it is a admissions uh, program, um, the, where were the schools? I mean, if someone particularly cheated on the cheating aspect <coughs> on the athletic side, you know, th was there no one doing the verification? That's actually quite easy to determine whether the scores are appropriate, matching the other parts of the the, the student's academic record. Uh, on, on the athletic side, I mean, it's pretty easy to verify whether <laughs> someone can actually play the sport or not. Um, and so we, all the outrage, I think, toward the parents, toward the consultants, I mean, are, are, is absolutely well-founded and, and needs to be, the pressure needs to be stay, uh, you know, put on there. But at the same time, we can't let the schools off the hook here, too, yeah. because they are, they, they are not really victims here. They just were not doing their due diligence, and it obviously shows that a, a, a serious failure on their part to make sure that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing in the admissions process. Someone on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me actually suggested that they punish the schools by making those students actually play the sports. <laughs> 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 but in the broader sense, I mean, there could be a policy component here eventually, whether it actually kind of you know, comes to fruition or not. Uh, here in the state of California, UCLA was one yeah. of the schools. And so is there something that you know, occurs at the state level in Sacramento or with the UC regents uh, that really starts to really kind of you know, scrutinize what's happening on the admission side, uh, particularly for the UC system? But then nationwide also, I mean, it, it, does this become a federal issue at some point about how we address privilege in higher education in the, in the country? And that is at heart what this is all about. Mostly. Well, I mean, politically, though, I mean, just yesterday, I want to say, I think it was yesterday, Time and time and space, so weird these days. <laughs> um, so I think it was just yesterday that um, there was a subcommittee. Uh, so there's the budget committee in the state assembly, and they had a, their budget subcommittee on education had a whole hearing about whether or not UC schools should even consider SAT and ACT scores anymore. Um, there is certainly there's some folks who are really pushing to stop using those tests altogether and just look at grades and extracurricular activities, which. I think there are decent arguments on both sides of this. And for some folks, they say, look, we still need a way to compare people across things. We all know what happens when you give a kid a C at a school 
mom just calls up, <laughs> berates the teacher. I mean, there is a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure on teachers uh, to, to give good grades um, just to, to certain students. Uh, and then at the same time, you know, we've got all these issues with the test. So the question is, you know, how do we make, can we make the test more foolproof? Um, can we give fewer dispensations for people to take it privately, et cetera? So we're, we're still grappling with sort of how do we make the test meaningful? And, uh, and if we can't, you know, how do we, you know, use other factors and make them meaningful? And, and it's not clear, you know, that there's a that there's a clear path here. But they've already had a hearing, so there is a movement um, to to really examine this issue. Um, someone asks about how did Trump and Kushner kids get into college. We already mentioned the Kushner kids. Did the Trump children go to his alma mater? Are they Wharton? I actually kids? don't know. Yeah, no, I don't I'm, actually. I'm know. sure they're Ivy Leaguers, but I don't know which one. Sorry, I don't have an answer on that. <laughs> uh, what about private coaches for college admission essays? <clears throat> I didn't even know these things existed when I was... Oh, it's a huge industry. Oh, it's it? enormous. I mean, I mean that's, that's open. I mean, people hire even, you know, some closer to middle-income people hire coaches for their... And this goes back to the privilege aspect of it yeah. all. I mean, it's not just the privilege of being able to <laughs> afford to live in the right zip codes to send you to the right schools or be able to afford to go to private schools and have those connection points. I mean, people forget the private schools, their counselors are basically networking with yeah. Ivy League and, and top university you know, admissions counselors to, to basically build those relationships. But then also on the, kind of on the, even the, you know, the upper middle and even middle class are able to afford coaches on essays, on SAT prep, on all of these sort of aspects that really give them an upper hand in the sense of getting through into these schools, whereas less privileged individuals and students don't have that access. So but this is brazen. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. clearly illegal, but it's not also the, the, the be all end all. There's a lot of other aspects about what it means to be able to achieve higher education in this country. Is it illegal, that kind of coaching? Because I mean, it's not that coaching, no, but oh. what the, what I mean, what, you know, the, what, the other, yes. Yeah, there's okay. the other stuff, Got bribery it. and, and. And I guess when it comes to broad. public policy, is this a reflection just of rich people will do as rich people do, or is this a reflection of it's harder and harder to get into universities. The you know the funding has been cut so much. It's much more expensive. Uh, they're more selective. Anything? I mean, is is it a reflection of that? I think it's also a perception on the part of a lot of parents that if my kid doesn't go to X school, they're doomed. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. if my kid's at you know at this you know lesser school. My God, what is going to happen to them? They're just not going to live up to their potential. It is my job. The ends justify the means here, right? And whatever right. it takes, I'm going to give my kid the best opportunity I can, no matter who I have to pay or bribe or blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to do my best because they got to get there with like the right kind of people and they're going to set them up for the rest of their life. Um, regardless of the effect it has on the kid, who now has been told basically you, you can't even write your own essay about your own self. Um, you can't get into college yourself. Uh, and you're, you know, you're too dumb to take the SAT yourself. And your parents are uh, going to jail. Yeah, you're, yeah, mom and dad are, you know. So uh, it's, you know, regardless of that, like there's, I think that there's a perception and, and maybe it's grounded in reality. I mean, we do see uh, a real difference in sort of what the impact of college is for certain, you know, for certain tier of schools mm -hmm. versus other tiers mm -hmm. of schools. And so, uh, you know, that there's this real thought that if I don't get my kid into like the best school possible, they're going to be, you know, homeless, you know what I mean, yeah. like that. And so they, you know, that sort of gives them the, the ethical dispensation to really do whatever it takes. And I, I mean, I feel for these kids in a way too, because psychologically, I mean, they're, they're so much pressure. I mean, you just yeah. ride the Caltrain down to Palo Alto and mm -hmm. you know, a number of years ago, we had the, the, that rash of uh, suicides. Yep. Um, and a lot of it comes down to the pressure that is attached to students attending Poly High School. Um, but then also, are they actually ready for college, yeah. let alone then graduate school? Because right now, bachelor degrees are really just in the new high school degree. You really have to go on to get a master's, really to start to exceed uh, within your career and your professional life. And so are they really ready for the bachelor's degree, let alone then moving on to higher degree levels uh, in the future? Yeah. They'll have to take up another fake sport to get into grad school. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, we don't have sports in grad school, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Someone writes from the audience, This afternoon, officially, spring 2019 has begun. Usually, spring is the new beginning to celebrate. What can we celebrate this season? That leads us right into our next topic, which is everything Trump. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's do a roundup of news concerning the president. Um, and let's start with he issued his first veto. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, this was uh, a veto in response to a Democratic uh, written bill, did get some bipartisan support. Um, in the Senate, we know there were 12 Republicans who went for it. I don't recall in the House uh, the l number, if, if any Republicans voted for it. Yeah, but there were some. It, they did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but he vetoed it, which was expected. I'm more kind of want to get at what is this whole mystical uh, uh, aura we have around a president not having to veto something? It's it's what it's just part of the job, yeah. you know. I mean, and, and and you can spin it either way. Either hey, I don't have to veto anything because Congress does whatever I want, or I stopped Congress from doing something really stupid. Uh, Carson, any thoughts on is this a is this a momentous thing in in any president's thing or? If, who should we care if they veto something every week? Well, I mean, it's the, the, it's the way our system was designed, and I think it's designed for the better. This checks and balances. It, it, to be honest, this, this should be happening more often. We should be seeing it more often at the state level also. Um, that, I mean, that, that they're, just because you're same, part of the same party or you're part of different parties doesn't automatically mean you are never going to have to veto something or always going to be vetoing something. That's not the, the reason. It's not partisan mechanism, it's a policy mechanism. Is this the best approach to move forward? And obviously a bipartisan Congress, controlled by the Republicans in the Senate and controlled by the Democrats in the House, sent a, a large rebuke to the president on one of his signature policies, and he decided, you know what, no, this is my policy, I'm going to own this, mm -hmm. and he issued, issued that veto. The system worked in this sense. Now, we may not like the end result with what actually happened with the veto and the, you know, the national emergency is moving forward, um, but the system structurally worked in a sense. So when the National Emergencies Act was first passed, it was uh, the way that Congress could override the president and, and sort of end the national emergency only required a majority vote. And so it, when President Ford actually signed it, he said, I'm signing this, but I think this is unconstitutional because you're not letting me veto this. And around the time, and this is post-Nixon, so like, you know, they're really weird about giving the president power to do stuff. And so they've been using this thing, this, uh, this way to pass a law and make it non-vetoable in a couple different avenues. So when they first pass it, they, they think that all you need is a majority to stop the president's national emergency. That's the way it lives. And this is 1976. So then 1983, finally, one of these little non-vetoable moves gets, and it's not this one, but it's something else, but the <coughs> same thing, moves up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they say, no, if it's, a, if it's got the force of law, it has to be vetoable, because that's in the Constitution. So 1985, they amend the National Emergencies Act to make it a vetoable thing for Congress to, you know, to try to stop the president. And so my point is when they pass, when Congress passes, they did not think they needed a two thirds majority. <laughs> that came much later. That was, you know, like a decade later, it was like, oh yeah, now we have to make it vetoable because I don't know, I don't think that necessarily at the time that would have, that would fly, <laughs> frankly, if they knew they had to basically have a two thirds majority every single time. Otherwise the president, um, you know, otherwise, you know, the president could do whatever he wanted. So, um, there, the veto power has been used by a lot of people a lot more. I think it was Bill Clinton had over like over 100 of them. I mean, other presidents have used this a lot more frequently. So I don't think that's the thing to get worried about. But I think, you know, people were, may be shocked that, like, that you can veto this kind of thing. And there, that's the reason why, because, uh, because the U.S. Supreme Court has said, you know, basically if it has the force of law, the president has to be able to veto it. And that really kind of changed what the law stood for. Having said that, this is the first time we've had this situation because most of the national emergency declarations are like, let's stop, you know, buying coconuts from Madagascar. I mean, like they're really a lot of a lot of foreign policy, a lot of trade, a lot of things that no one really disagrees about. So, I, you know, what's really interesting and new and unique about this is this is the first time we've seen it in this context, but it's all, it's been there since 1985. And I don't know, I mean, maybe folks on, some of the Republicans are like, we're voting against this because what if somebody on the left does the same thing? Mm -hmm. We're going to see, you know, now a whole new practice here. Yeah. It's, uh, what's interesting to me is whether this has an effect on the lawsuits because there are a number of them uh, claiming that this is not a national emergency, that it's just a way to get around Congress's uh, budgeting power. Um, and it will be interesting to see if this Supreme Court looks at it that way, because it's clear nobody really wants, you know, the wall. People, 
people may want uh, stronger immigration enforcement, but nobody really wants that money to go for a mall. I, I had... Uh, if, mall part, or a mall? Oh, a mall. Or a mall. <laughs> that would be a Malls are not good. <laughs> I don't know, a mall on the border. <laughs> yeah. right? mall, yeah, right. That would be actually yeah. quite yeah. good for the, the economy. <laughs> but no walls, right? <laughs> um, just quickly, I had an interesting conversation the other night with Sochi Torres Small, the new Democratic uh, woman, Congress, Congresswoman from um, uh, southern New Mexico with the whole border, I guess, in her, in her district. And it had been a Republican district, and she, she won it this time. The, the incumbent ran for governor. Um, and we were talking about, I was in a group, and she was on, uh, uh, on the screen, but we, we were discussing the wall, and, and uh, she said, well, you know, a lot of my constituents, you know, think, still think the wall is, is okay. And, uh, and somebody said, oh, do you, do you tell them about how the Mexicans were supposed to pay for it? And she was very interesting. She said, no, I don't, because that just makes people angry and makes them dig in more. She said, what I do is I start where they are. They're concerned about immigration. She said, and as, as you do that and talk through, well, what does a wall really mean in this area where nobody comes across anyway? Whereas, what can we do about the people who, this, this flood of folks seeking asylum, that is, if there is an emergency, and nobody really, I mean, a lot of people don't think it is, um, that's not going to be fixed by a wall because they're all coming through legal checkpoints. And I just thought it was so interesting that a member of this young maverick class of, uh, of congresspersons um, had this very old-fashioned way of looking at how politics should work. You know, if you're, if you're a Democrat and you want to persuade Republicans, you don't say Republicans are idiots, as the president does about Democrats. You say, you know, here's where we agree, and it, it, let me just explain something. Maybe you'd agree with me more. It's too crazy to be real. <laughs> it's weird. Yes. Well, I, just, I don't think Democrats do themselves any favors by saying everything's fine. Yeah. You know, like you say, oh, there's an emergency. And they go, well, it's not an emergency. And maybe it isn't or it isn't. But, but there is something very unusual happening at the border. And if we can't all hold hands and say this is weird and we need to do something and maybe it's not a wall, maybe it's something else. But, but, but when they're like, oh, well, apprehensions are down. Well, uh, you know, my eyeballs say there's a bridge full of people and this is not something we've ever seen before. And so to say or to imply that, you know, we're fine, it's cool, we just need to, you know, tweak this or that and everything will be fine is, is not helpful, I think, for Democrats to say. And again, they don't have to agree that there's an emergency, but to say, but to not agree that there's something unusual uh, is not helpful and, and, and just belies normal people's eyeballs on the whole thing, on the whole thing, and certainly statistics uh, of, of certainly at the, the asylum seekers at the very least mm -hmm. at, at the border. But they can talk about, uh, for instance, the, the border con patrol is underfunded by like, is undermanned by a thousand positions. Mm -hmm. Congress passed money to hire a thousand more people. And the Trump administration, which generally just doesn't like to hire government people, has not filled those positions. Now, if you had, and people, there's terrible morale, people are working overtime because there are those people coming through. If you had a fully staffed border patrol, that would go a long way towards yeah. controlling things. And that's what I think, the de and some Democrats, I mean, I've had that pointed out to me by several Democrats, uh, some of them talk about those things, and I think that's the effective way to deal with it. Uh, when I think it was Rick Wilson was here and he was talking about kind of democratic priorities and he said, you know, Democrats are making immigration a really big priority because they think it'll really help them with Hispanic voters. And some of you have heard me say this already in the past, but he said it's not. Uh, you know, you, when you do the polling with, with uh, <coughs> Latino voters and Latina voters, um, it's like uh, education, I forget what the other one was, the economy, something like that. Those two are way up here immigration issues are down here. It, it matters to them. That's not saying it doesn't matter to them, but that's not going to 
you know, swing that vote, voting what, block. What That's matters is the tone, really, yes. at the end of the day, <clears throat> and why, particularly, I mean, California Republicans are so toxic now with all, you know, non-white uh, races in the states. It's because of the tone. Um, and how, primarily how they've talked about immigration over the years, not just with Latinos, but also with Asians uh, as well, because they really associate themselves also as an immigrant population, particularly in this state. So it, for the Democrats, they need to really think about the tone that they're talking about here and not alienating the, the white voters that they need, the suburban white voters that really is where they made their big advances in the 2018 midterms. <coughs> Um, and that they need to win back when they're thinking about the Electoral College in 2020, but then also the tone about how do they then you know, address the, the, their, their base, their, their non-white uh, particular base. Well, and I do want to point out, so the president is looking at three pots of money, right? So when he came out with his declaration of emergency and sort of, I'm, getting, I'm going to grab the money for the wall, he said three pots of money. Only one of them requires a declaration of emergency as a predicate. Two of them do not. <coughs> so Congress has given the president the power to grab money um, from other pots of money for things arguably on the border for drug, uh, to, to stop drug smuggling in certain places, for example. But when we talk about the national emergency, understand that even if courts say there is no national emergency, like this is all bunk, yeah. there is still about half of the money that he's asked for like I want to say six or eight billion is still perfectly available under laws that Congress has passed uh, and it, in, since the 90s. So uh, and Democrats have supported, by the way, um, abdicating this power or giving this power to the president. And so now what we're seeing is a president going and using it and everyone going, oh, my gosh. But remember, even without a national emergency, there is still billions of money that he can use to build barriers, a wall, whatever. Um, where he wants to on the border. So let's not get totally distracted by the, <coughs> by the emergency thing. You know, he can send you over there as a sharp, shiny object and still be doing a lot with what he already has the ability to get. Uh, someone writes in, do you know Devin Nunez's mom? No. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Don't know the cow either. But that brings us back to Twitter. And every time we talk about uh, the, presidential, the president having a tweet storm, um, I'll almost always get someone who sends forth a question card saying, why are you wasting time talking about the president's tweets? Talk about substantive stuff. Um, so <laughs> having said that, <laughs> President Trump has gotten into a Twitter war with Meghan McCain. Mm -hmm. This is all just within the last couple of days. Meghan McCain and uh, with uh, Twitter itself. Saturday Night uh, Live. Saturday Night Live, even though it was a repeat. Um, <laughs> We, let's, we don't need to get into all of them because, again, you're right, there are other things to talk about. But what is the thing with John McCain? Why can't he move on to that? Why can't he even make himself bigger by saying, recognizing this guy was a war hero? It doesn't even seem like something that his base should identify with. I mean, a lot of them are, uh, some of them at least, military. are former military. Yeah. Uh, but I just want to say, I mean, I think Twitter what the president says on Twitter is important because it's the only time he speaks to us. I mean, he does not really do press conferences mm -hmm. the way others did. And when he gives speeches, he gives them as campaign speeches to sympathetic audiences. There's no other interaction with the general public if you don't follow him on Twitter. I have a, I have a coworker who's got, and I have no idea how he did this. I would never. But it, he's got this thing where every time the president tweets, he gets like a notification. Yeah on his phone, and I was like, you are going to die young. You have to stop that. Turn that thing off. You're going to have a heart attack. <laughs> like, how can, can you imagine? You know, bless his heart. I was like, you, have, you can't, you cannot be distracted with, and don't get me wrong, it's, they're important, and we do get information that way, and Lord knows we learn about policy things that way. Um, but, uh, but following every single thing, you're just, it's, you know, it's bananas. It's not healthy. But, um, but yeah, I mean, he's, he clearly gets in moods. And, you know, we'll take aim, but, you know, but I think part of it, and I think, well, maybe it's a conspiracy theory, but, but there are certainly folks who believe that what he's doing is just kicking up dirt so that you don't see what, you know, the left hand is doing, like a magician who, you know, sort of does one thing over here, so you don't, you don't look that, you know, the, to see what they're doing with the cards over here. So, um, you know, so we always have to, even as journalists, be really careful about, okay, something's come out and it's really outrageous, 
is there something else going on that right. that that we should actually be looking at? Well, and, and that's something we always have to think about. Yeah, and you know what people these days are keep saying it's like Mueller's report is I- imminent. You know, does he know anything about this? Which of course we wouldn't know the answer to that, but. That's what well, people are wondering about. On the Devin Nunes thing, I have to say, you guys remember years back, it was Barbara Streisand had an issue with her house being like, the, somebody published, I think, like the location of her house. Right. And so she sued about it. And then everybody was like, really? Where's her house? Like, yeah. and no one knew yeah. until she started making a stink about it, about this thing. <laughs> and so everyone's comparing that to, not everyone, but the you know, cow. lots of folks are comparing the Devin Nunes' mom Twitter to that because like, who knew even about that until, so of course, immediately my husband and I were sitting there, he was like, I'm going to Devin Nunes' mom's Twitter. <laughs> You know, like, thank you, Devin. We had no idea that there was this parody account out there. And Devin Nunez's cow's Twitter feed now has more subscribers than Devin, Devin, Devin Nunez's. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. he's made an issue of yeah, it. Right. Yes. Yeah, right. The strikes and effect. I, I mean, I just generally think, I mean, to try to psychoanalyze as Kellyanne Conway's husband has recently. Oh, let's um, talk about that. <laughs> uh, Donald Donald Trump, our president, is always a risky business uh, because, again, you don't know. Is it massive marketing genius um, in what he's doing, or is it just pure uh, hysteria and grudges that he cannot kind of get over? And um, unfortunately, probably only Donald Trump and maybe Ivanka truly know uh, what the the, the true answer there is, unfortunately. but it, it, it's, it, I don't know, as, as a former Republican, it's kind of weird, this obsession he has with someone the Republican Party has very much idolized and supported for so long and who has really shaped the modern Republican Party. I mean, he was, the John McCain was our standard bearer um, at one point and mm-hmm. came very close to doing it at an earlier point. So um, the fact that he is so... <coughs> Hell bent on really kind of dragging his legacy through the mud, and not so much what the president is doing, but then what the Republican Party is not really full heartedly kind of trying to stop it um, is also quite disconcerting as well. Um, and it really goes to, to, to speak to the um, the cult of personality that our political parties truly have become, in the sense of whoever is the standard bearer of the of the party at that given time, uh, you can't go against them. We saw it with the Democratic Party, also with uh, President Obama. Um, you could kind of go back and maybe say George W. Bush was in a certain a similar situation, but really in the Clinton <coughs> era, I wouldn't say that we were at that point yet of this true cult of personality where the the, the parties were unwilling to really challenge who their president was in certain cir- circumstances when it really deviated from the principles of that particular party. And, and we, now we're really starting to see it. Yeah. And we should point out, I mean, Senators Mitt Romney, uh, Isaacson, I believe, of Georgia, have both spoken out. Yes, very, I mean, very, which is great, but it, it, it's, where's Mitch McConnell? Where's, yeah. um, you know, where's the entire caucus, you know, caucus for the parties um, who at one point supported, you know, John McCain yeah. in his in his presidential run, who, I mean, sat there at, at his funeral and were quite um, endearing to his well-deserved send-off um, and, and those aspects. So, I mean, regardless of your political per- persuasion, I mean, John McCain was an American hero um, and continues to be so, and politics should not determine whether that is the case or not. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, moving off the tweet-related issues, um, Hope Hicks, a former White House communications director and longtime confidant of the president, uh, reportedly plans to cooperate with the House, uh, I guess it's the Judiciary Committee's request for certain documents related to Michael Flynn's lying to the FBI, James Comey's firing a hush money scheme, and misleading statement about Donald Trump Jr.'s Trump Tower meeting with the Russians. Um, and and uh, this might be more a legal question for Melissa, but any of you, what does... If, if the Democrats, who, who now have subpoena power in, in the House, what does that actually mean? I mean, is that more of a political power, or does that, is that actual judicial power? If, if these, any of these administration agencies do not cooperate, and there is talk about them not cooperating, um, and she's no longer in the administration, I should point out, but I mean, what is their legal power? I mean, can they haul someone to jail or just issue really bad press releases? Um. <laughs> Withering sarcasm. Yes. That's their that's their power. No, uh, they do have legal power. Actually, they do have okay. the legal power to subpoena. And but here's the thing: it takes a while because here and this is why you're like, well, Democrats have been in charge for 
like six hours, like let's go. Um, so, but generally how it works is you, you sort of issue a very nice letter and you go, we really appreciate it if you would give us blah, 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 blah. And then they don't. And then you go 30 days later, you go, we really, really want this. 30 days later, we strenuously. Um, and so you have to sort of go through this, you know, with little kabuki theater of practice of, you know, sort of, and then you finally get to the subpoena. They actually rarely issue subpoenas. Generally, like a mean letter is kind of going to get you there. And the reason why it works is because they know ultimately they do have legal subpoena power. Okay. So you ask nicely and then a little less and less and less. And then after about, you know, three or four months of this, then you can then go to a judge mm -hmm. and then ask the judge to issue the real subpoena. So then the judge is like, all right, so on behalf of me, you know, judge so-and-so, I'm issuing the subpoena. Now, at that point, we have an even longer process because if you're the receiving end of that, you can say, I don't want to give you this and I'm going to appeal it and appeal it, appeal it. So it's a lengthy process, but at the end of the day, assuming it's not completely bananas, I mean, the, the standard is... Um, the standard for stopping a congressional subpoena is pretty high, mm -hmm. right? So generally speaking, they've got the right to subpoena anything that's sort of reasonable. Um, they can't subpoena like Hope Hicks's like diary, right? They're, they, can, they can subpoena emails and other things. So, so it's a pro so it is a legal right, but it is a very long process. And the Democrats have to be able to show, look, we ha we asked very nicely. Look at all these letters where we asked very nicely that we would like a subpoena. And then, you know, then there's all these opportunities to contest that. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, <clears throat> yes, the, a judge a judge's subpoena will issue or can issue. And then if they still don't give you the, the, the stuff, then you have to go to the sheriff and have them arrested. So. There is actually jail time at the end of it, but it's a very lengthy process, one that could easily drag on till after the 2020 election, oh. right? And that may be, you know, a plan. You know, that may be one way to plan it. Um, so Democrats want to do this as speedily as possible in conformity with the law and general practice, but they, you know, I think would hope to have it uh, under control before maybe the primaries in 2020, et cetera. But, but it can definitely take a long time, and, but it is enforceable. You could go to jail, and I don't think anyone ever has, maybe during the McCarthy era, maybe. But um, it's rare that it gets that far because people know, because they're lawyers, because then they go to their lawyer and go, do I have to? And the lawyer goes, well... No, but you could also go to jail and they go, maybe I will. And so that's usually how it goes. But, but uh, the, the strategically long legal fight may be yeah. part of the plan. There, there, I mean, there is some precedent for them, them the, the congressional uh, leaders, not even issuing the subpoena. When Robert Reich was here uh, last year, he was telling a story about how things changed like that once the Republicans retook the House in 94. 94. And Newt Gingrich came in and his leadership came in. And Robert Reich came back to his office one day, and there were young Republican staffers rifling through their files. And he's you know, talking to his, his chief of staff. He's saying, what are they looking for? And she says, anything they can find against you. Yeah. So, I mean, do they have that power to send someone into where? where which, which agency might they want to go into and just take the information instead of just asking for it? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure that, that that's a legal power or more just a like, hey, guys, <laughs> go down the hall and check the binders. Um, I'm not sure that they have the power to 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 just without an official ask yeah. send. I, I don't think that there's sort of an open door for all agents, for all government agencies. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine <laughs> if there was? Sporting. Amazing. No, I don't think they could do that. I think, but I think that that, was, that might have been an, uh, an informal, hey, the door was unlocked, whatever's on your desk, we're just going to grab. Um, and that was probably also pre, uh, you know, uh, what's the, uh, what's the slack, you know, or whatever, you know, all the, most things are electronic now, like okay. rifling through the things on anyone's desk is not going to yeah. get you much <laughs> anywhere, frankly, these days. It really is more of an electronic sweep um, that they would have to do. So no, you don't, you can't just, you know, walk down the hall. I think, you know, Democrats wish that were the case, <laughs> but that's not. Um, Barbara Carson, do you think then, therefore, if this can take a really long time, that Democrats will, have, will try to pursue some other way to get cooperation? Or will they just enjoy the fact that they can put pressure on the White House and that's really the end game for some of them? I, uh, Sorry, Carson? Barbara? Barbara, if you have something. I, I, was, I, I think the Mueller investigation will end within this year, I assume. And I think what happens with that will determine a lot about what Congress does. I, I feel, to bring it back kind of the politics, you know, you have to be careful with kind of how many messages you're throwing about. 
you know, particularly when right now it's okay because the, there's no democratic standard bear, you know, for the presidential candidate right now. They're kind of duking it out right now. So the House can really be kind of the face of the Democratic Party for the country. Yeah. Um, once you really get into the season, Iowa, New Hampshire, and, and et cetera, if you're doing too much in the House and distracting from kind of what your candidates or candidate is, is saying and doing, um, is that actually then helping you or hurting you more? And that's a decision that you know Nancy Pelosi and her team and then whoever will be the, the standard bearer will um, have to have, have, have a discussion about because you don't want to be doing too much in the House right. where all of a sudden you're opening up opportunities for your Democratic candidate to be attacked by the president or you know, things start slipping out <laughs> or also becoming kind of a, well, you're, you're attacking him for this, but your candidate also kind of did something like this in a way and it becomes yeah. very um, mushy at times. And to be honest, Voters just aren't paying attention to this stuff. No. They're not. Their voters are not paying attention to the Twitter battles. Voters are not paying attention to what's happening out there. Um, they're living their lives. And so you have to be very clear, consistent, and concise with what you're doing. And so Nancy Pelosi has a very hard task at hand to make sure that she is being clear, consistent, and concise with what her caucus is doing. And it's all the harder to do it when you have people like AOC and others running around yeah. um, <laughs> doing whatever they want to do. Uh, so. Um, it's a challenge, but it comes down to what is their message, okay. and their message has to be on point going into 2020. Voters in here excluded, of course. Right, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, yeah. The smart, Always brilliant, excluding you educated all. Commonwealth <laughs> Club members. But also, my husband's in marketing, and he always says, you know, if you tell people one thing, they'll hear one thing. If you tell people three things, they'll hear nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so whatever they're doing, they need to be doing more quickly so hopefully they can get it right. one place or another before we start working on a candidate. And that was a big criticism of Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016, that she was running 15 different messages, yep. depending on where she was at what time and, and what day, you know, time of day. And at the end, for all of the 2016 Donald Trump faults, his message was very clear, very consistent, yeah. and very resonating with a, uh, with a mass audience, apparently. Um, and so uh, the Democrats need to make sure that they are focused in that sort of way, both at the House side, but then ultimately whoever their candidate is. Okay. Uh, someone in the audience asked something that I think takes us into some state politics. <coughs> we were actually talking about this in the, in the green room before the program. Do you think there will be another referendum to repeal the death penalty? Hmm. Now, recently, of course, Governor Gavin Newsom made national news by uh, saying he was going to put a stop to uh, executions in the state. Um, Barbara, what do you think about that? Was that was this something he had indicated he was planning on doing? I mean, did he run on this? No, he he uh, he's always been against the death penalty, I believe, but it was not part of his campaign. And I mean, I think I'm against the death penalty. And as as uh, my personal beliefs would not allow me to sign death warrants. And and I think it might have been possible for uh, the governor to make a statement along those lines and not just blow up the uh, the initiative. But he didn't do that. He's not subtle about these things. And, and he needed, I think he needed a gay marriage issue, um, which was his splash when he, when he came to City Hall and um, just basically called everybody who voted for that measure in 2016 a racist. And I, I mean, it was, it was not what Zochi in New Mexico does, you know, <laughs> to bring people along. Are these? Melissa? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, he didn't tell us, <laughs> you know, no. I mean, that would have been very good. You know, by the way, and don't get me wrong, I think he probably still would have won, but, oh, yeah. but it was weird that he gets there and all of a sudden, and this seems to be his thing. Uh, and I'm concerned that we're see we're not seeing so much, um, <clears throat> let me cooperate and create some good legislation as let me do sort of like you pointed out, like with gay marriage, here's something I can do. I can make a grand proclamation and I don't need any legislative authority to do it. And I can just do it and like create the law, change the law all on my own. And if that sounds familiar, 
It should. <laughs> and I'm not saying it's this, we're even close to the same level, but that is also freaky, right? I mean, again, he's got he's perfectly within his legal rights to do it, but but it's a norm that that he's breaking. It is a norm that if if voters literally five seconds ago <laughs> told you we would like to do this, and then you go on the news and say that's racist and I'm not going to do it, it's like okay, interesting. I'm sure like the the majority of California voters who voted for it were like, uh, what? Uh, so, you know, that's a very strange way of sort of making your first splash is to come out with this thing, which, again, you told no one about that you were going to do, which was clearly foreseeable because it's part of your duties as a governor. Uh, and then and then to just do it when someone when when folks just voted for it. And again, whether or not you're for you know, the death penalty or not. When someone says, hey, you know, free ice cream for all today, you go, thank you, I like ice cream, <laughs> but what are you doing? <laughs> and is that okay? Is it an okay exercise of power? And again, legal, but, um, but also uh, very odd. And I wonder how many of these grand proclamations we're gonna see out of him, which again, appears to be his favorite thing, uh, as opposed to actually, you know, getting in the mud with the legislature and, and getting, you know, and getting other kinds of legislation done. I mean, we're early on in the season. Maybe he's great at that. I don't know. But um, but it just uh, it was really surprising uh, and, and a real breach of, I think, norms because Jerry Brown could have done that. He was no lover of mm -hmm. the death penalty, but he was like, hey, you know, voters said this. So here's what we're going to do. And then Newsom comes in and just you know, cuts it off. I think he's going to, I don't know if he'll pay politically for it. Maybe, you know, next time around, everyone will have forgotten about it. Maybe did it early enough. So it'll be ancient history by the time the next election comes around. But, um, but I think there are polls show that there are a number of folks who are really disappointed. I mean, to answer the question, Governor Newsom better hope that there's not another vote <laughs> on this matter, because I could probably fairly certainly expect voters to endorse the death penalty again, even at this point in time. I mean, we've, in the last decade, voted on the death penalty, either abolishing it or strengthening it three times, I believe. Mm -hmm. Well, either once in 2012 or twice in 2012 and once in 2016 or, or vice versa. There were a, a lot of different ballot initiatives in, uh, over the last few cycles. So this is not something that uh, is, he's not on the right side of the voters here. And these are, both instances, they were presidential elections, so high turnouts. They were both well-funded campaigns. Um, and so you can't say, well, oh, well, people just didn't vote. They didn't really know what they're talking about. They didn't know what they were voting on. That's not the case in, in these situations. Uh, so you better hope that there's not another uh, ballot initiative on it because he'll be rebuked, I think, by the voters again. Um, but, I mean, it's not the only time. I mean, we're seeing also a rash of rent control-related bills uh, in Sacramento that have popped up amongst uh, some assembly members. And the voters just said no to undoing Casa Hawkins, which would have uh, opened up rent control statewide, uh, the possibility of rent control statewide. So there's kind of a disconnect going on in Sacramento right now. And um, it, it's, I, I don't know what's happening. I feel like they're juiced up because they now have their three quarters mm -hmm. plus one majority <laughs> um, going on. They're like, well, we don't really need to listen to the rest of the state. We, 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 got, our, we got our majority. We're set. The, de the Republican Party is dead in the state. We don't really need to do anything. We don't have to worry about repercussions anymore. And that's not a good place to be when you're, you're the majority party, because then things start to really come unravel fast in that case. And when you don't have a viable opposition party ready to pick up the pieces, that's, there's a lot of uncertainty there in terms of policy and politics. Was Gavin Newsom, it's my impression that when Gavin was mayor of San Francisco, he was not collaborative. He was not great well, at working with people. Well, <laughs> not with the Board of Supervisors, which in fact did put on the ballot at one point a demand that the mayor would have to actually come and talk to them, I think once a month or something like that. <laughs> um, there, there, were, there were wars and, and uh, one can certainly sympathize with uh, the then mayor on a, a number of fronts, mm -hmm. but um, on the journalism side or getting the, I mean, I don't, did you cover him when he was mayor? I did. I did. And he had a very contentious relationship with the board uh, and a very contentious relationship with the media. I mean, was also very closed off and would only talk at certain times. But uh, 
he definitely mean, remember remember and this is actually one of my favorite stories but remember when the um when the olympic torch came through san francisco and it was a there was this is one american city that the olympic torch was going to come through and it was a big deal and there were and there was like the route that it was supposed to go on and there were huge people out there the free tibet people were out there and they wrote a big thing on the golden gate bridge and there were tons of protesters on the embarcadero which is where it was supposed to go but we did but he didn't go down that route at the last minute he said no and so the the car went a different way and it was out of like a TV, it was it was crazy. Everyone's like, "Wait, where is he?" And like, people are running and like trying to figure out where the torch is because they want to protest. But he's like diverted it. But this is the kind of like he loves this like executive power. He loves to be the guy who like made the decision to like do the thing and like screw you guys. I'm gonna do what I want now. Don't get me wrong. Again, the whole like you know sort of you know Tom and Jerry thing was just. <laughs> crazy. I, I don't mean to diminish the issues of Tibet and, and things going on in China, but but w when you have like people trying to, you know, figure out where the car is and what street it's on and, you know, da -da, um, it, it was, that's when he's in his element. I mean, he really loves like the righteous individual move. Um, and that's just an example of the kind of thing he did. And sometimes he's on the right side. Sometimes when it comes to same-sex marriage, for example, like that was something that was bold and he can be really proud of. But But this kind of thing is, you know, seems to be his thing, even though he's got, he's, you know, he's, he sits there with this very contentious relationship with the legislature and then uses whatever levers he can uh, on, on the other side. And that's kind of how he was able to, you know, he, he did a lot of that when he was mayor. And we're seeing it, I mean, not just at the, at the state level in Sacramento, but we're also seeing this odd kind of, we don't want to engage the public uh, in these conversations yeah even happening at the local level. So I'll bring you down to Los Angeles, and uh, there's a homelessness problem down there, just as there is here. And the city council is trying to build um, homeless shelters in each of the various city council districts. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a rule that one has to be in each of the various districts. And so in Venice, where we all know is notoriously overridden by the homeless population, um, there's massive outrage about where the city council has decided to put the homeless shelter. Um, and it's largely because the city council and the staff and the elected officials never actually went and talked to the community members about where might this be a good location. Well, let's have a conversation about you know, the, the, where should we put this shelter. We're also seeing it in Koreatown in, in Los Angeles, this massive outrage about where they decided to put it. Without any conversations with the public at all, they just went in and said, okay, it's here, and then there was this massive riot almost, uh, you know, anger outreach toward the yeah. city council members, and they've had to backpedal quite aggressively and, and dramatically and say, okay, let's now have a conversation. Well, of course, you can imagine what that conversation's like at this yeah. point. Yeah. It's not really a conversation anymore, it's just, voters yelling at the or the uh, council member and their staffs, and in some cases the mayor. Um, so nothing really productive is happening now. And so we're seeing it up and down the state, we're seeing it across the country, and this kind of uh, avoidance of actually engaging the public in a meaningful way on really serious issues that are impacting the public on a day-to-day -day level. I mean, it, you, I live in Santa Monica. The, you, the, the homeless population is quite extreme. It's impacting my life as a resident of, that, of the town. Santa Monica has actually done a good job of engaging me as a resident and as a, as a voter. But a, and it's not, that's the abnorm, not the norm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, someone from the audience asks about uh, the comments and the movement to get rid of the Electoral College. This came up in the presidential election now with a couple of the Democratic candidates saying yes, we should get rid of the Electoral College and, and predictably Republicans who have been helped with it in a couple elections lately um, opposed it. Um, so let's use that as our entryway to some 2020 talk. Um, first of all, the Electoral College, is that an issue that anyone will actually huh, vote on? That's not going to be a voting issue for anyone. Does anyone disagree with that? I certainly Just hope not. <laughs> if there are bigger issues out there than the Electoral <laughs> College, let me tell you. <laughs> Wasn't there a movement a few years ago, and I think California might have signed on to it, states, uh, states would agree to vote the electoral, electoral the College popular vote. Yeah. based yeah. on the, the vote and, and split the Electoral College vote if 
a majority of states or however a, a, a governing majority of states yeah, yeah. accepted it, then, then it would kick in. I don't even know if that's still out there. So, Colorado just passed it. Actually. Did they? Yeah. yeah. yeah in order for it, in order for it to to sort of take effect, you have to have states that have the equivalent of 270 electoral college votes right. to buy into it. And right now they're at about 180 with Colorado. Yeah. So we're still, you know, a lot. I don't think it's going to happen before 2020. It could, right. but I don't. I don't think it is. Um, and if it is, ev even then, it may be subject to to legal challenges because of the Constitution and. The idea that the Constitution is going to be amended is just kind of not a thing <laughs> anymore, especially since the states that benefit, there are enough states that benefit from the Electoral College, from their disproportionate mm -hmm. um, you know, representation because of it, that, uh, that I don't think that, that they're going to let uh, an Electoral College change actually happen. And the thing <laughs> is, you know, you go, oh, I hate the Electoral College and that's terrible. But what if, <laughs> but what if the tables were turned? Hmm. Right. Uh, what if it was the case that a Democrat was able to get, um, you know, enough electoral college votes, but didn't win the majority vote? Like, you know, there could be, you know, serious, uh, very serious issues with that as well. So and I'm not defending the electoral college. I'm just saying it's it's one thing. It's happened a couple of times and it's happening more more frequently, which is <coughs> yeah. un really unsettling. Um, but. But it's one of those things you have to always think about. And people go, oh, screw the Electoral College. And you go, hey, you say that. <laughs> you say that now. But, you, you know, if you were in the other, if you were on the other side and, and, you know, history is long and things flip around, you know, you, you might think very differently about that. And so that rule that you have to cast your Electoral College votes in accordance with the majority vote, even if your state <laughs> did not. Right. Mm -hmm. Do that. Um, that would be, I think, a very tough, a very tough sell the day of. It's it's. To, like think about it. It's dangerous to change the rules of the game just because you aren't winning at the the current game. And the fact of the matter is, the Democrats were able to win with the current rules as recently as 2012. And so, it, don't uh, don't try to reshuffle the ga the you know the game board because you lost one election. Um, really think about what you're doing because these have long term consequences at hand. Um, Think about actually why did you lose the election, <laughs> um, and then go f go f forward from that point, point. Um, and then also make sure we actually have a true discussion on what is the alternative. You know, do we want our candidates just going to the the heavily populated states, um, not necessarily the urban areas? I mean, you can you can go to the heavily populated states without having to go to the urban areas, um, and completely ignoring uh, huge swaths of the country. Is that truly what we want our presidential candidates to be doing when we're talking about trying to unify a country, um, even particularly in a day of polarization? So you're saying the Democrats should hire a private coach for the <coughs> electoral college admission? Exactly. Yes. I mean, exactly. oh, okay. <laughs> Here's the kicker. I mean, Hillary Clinton knew what she needed to do to yes. win the election. She knew that she had to get to 270 electoral college votes. She, of anyone, <laughs> knew that. I mean, she'd been through two elections already um, at, the, at the presidential level and then also had run for, the, for uh, president prior to that, um, not ultimately becoming the candidate. Uh, so she knew what she had to do. So to say that she lost because of the rules, no. She lost because she did not do what she had to yeah, do. She had bad polling that told her she didn't need to focus exactly. on the states. She lost. So think about that. And that's what the 2020 candidates need to be thinking about. What is my pathway to 270? Right. Donald Trump did a, a different pathway than any other Republican had attempted. And it worked out for him. Um, the, the, the 2020 Democratic candidates may need a different pathway to get to the 270, um, but it's out there. The states are constantly shifting. Okay, so briefly before we get to the news quiz, um, candidates, Beto O'Rourke from Texas is in, and he raised money like a Bernie. Yeah. Um, wow. He actually beat Bernie <laughs> Sanders in, in, in uh, donations. <clears throat> Barbara, does he, what do you think is the, his role going to be? Is He's not polling toward the top yet right. of Democratic uh, candidates for president, but... Yeah. It's early he's, days. Well, he's fourth, fourth? right? Is okay. that what? Um, well, and out of so 700 of them, I guess that's... For, yeah. <laughs> <zero top. laughs> Joe Biden, Bernie, <laughs> Kamala now, and... and uh, uh, Beto. This, this yeah. Sweet yeah. Beto. Beto. Um, I, you know, it's minimal experience. I was, I was talking to Jackie Spear the other night. Um, actually, we did a Commonwealth Club thing together. 
Thank you. And uh, she, was, <laughs> she was saying, although this was not a discussion we had on Sage, but I'll mention it to you. She was saying she really likes Better O'Rourke. She, she worked with him in Congress. She just thinks he's wonderful. And she's glad he's in the race. Now, she would not go so far as to say she's all in. She's support. Obviously, she's going to be cautious. But, uh, but I was surprised to hear that strong a recommendation from someone um, of a more traditional bent and, and, and who uh, just had worked with him in Congress. Um, I don't know. I'm surprised at, at Kamala. I guess she is very good at, at uh, saying what people want to hear. It's, it's, in my experience, always what she's done. Mm-hmm. I would love to dig into that more, but we are running <laughs> short of time. Um, Just, but, but on the other hand, well, it's, it's interesting, though. Sometimes the, the president who does not, is not as doctrinaire mm-hmm. is, quite frankly, willing to, Bill Clinton, willing to have your end goals there, but mm-hmm. A, the goals can be fuzzy, and B, the direction to them you're very flexible on, that can sometimes be your route to success. Sure. I'm not endorsing anyone right now, but... <laughs> uh, Melissa, any thoughts on Beto or the other leaders? So I, I'm not going to take credit for this because this is something that was told to me today by Professor Jason McDaniel from SF State, who's great. Uh, and he said, uh, I asked him about this issue, and he said, um, he said right now, so Beto's at 11%, Kamala's at 12 right? And then Bernie and, uh, and uh, Biden are sort of in the 20s, mid-20s, high-20s. So, I mean, there's a little, there's a gap, but I mean, but she's, she's right in there and she's the only woman and the only person of color. And this is consistent. This has been happening since she joined the race. She jumped in in the end of January. And since then, she's been basically in third place the entire time. And she's basically been almost 100% in double digits. And she's the only, like I said, the only female candidate who's really done that. And again, only person of color who's done that. But now Beto's in, he's like, he's at 11, right underneath. And we have two polls now that say Kamala 12, Beto 11. I mean, margin of error, of course. Here's what Professor McDaniel told me. He said, right now, don't think so much about the polls. He said, think about who matters. Who really matters right now are the party insiders and activists in places like Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada, our first primary states. And he said, among those people, Kamala Harris is much more well-situated. And so while Beto O'Rourke may have raised more (coughs) money and while he may be polling at a certain level, you also have to look at who actually turns out in primaries and who's actually going to be the decision makers in the communities of people who are holding some of these initial primaries. And so that was part of his insight. And he said that that Kamala Harris is actually, you know, going to be, you know, in a really good position for that as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought that was really cool. Uh, Oh, the other thing he said, which I thought was great was, uh, and and certainly interesting, was that you have, Kamala Harris is not very well known. If you look at, you know, sort of the I don't know factor in the polls about her, it's, it's pretty large. But of the people who know her, she has really high favorabilities. So when you look at someone like Biden or Sanders, who people generally know, and that's, these are names who've been around and they say, okay, here we are, we're at 26 or 28. Um, that may be close to their ceiling and that someone like Harris, who really suffers from a lot of unknown, um, might actually have a lot of room to grow where these folks, where Biden or, or, or Sanders may grow, but probably not as much. I mean, people some, to some degree have made up their minds. And so he said Harris actually has a lot of runway uh, as well. So, and, and that may be the case for better work. We're not sure because he just announced. Yeah. But, um, but that was also a very optimistic thing that he told me about Harris. So he said she definitely has a pathway to, um, you know, to getting the nomination, frankly, uh, if she can continue to grow with the kind of favorabilities that she's had and with the right people, which is what she seems to be able to to be to, to do so far okay Carson last word there I mean how many are there right now I mean, 14 it's I mean and it's growing I mean there's yeah. there's still some I mean, yeah Biden who, is not yet announced right. though he kind of did and there's some who have announced their ex- exploration committees but not really actually and truly announced yet it's strange things can happen this is the thing about 2016 yeah. Yeah. Um, strange things happen when you have <laughs> That many people on a stage, when you have that many people vying for attention, uh, what can happen? Um, and who goes up and who goes down can depend on one slip of the tongue um, at a debate stage or at a <laughs> CNN town hall meeting. Um, one DNA test. Bad, right? <laughs> one DNA test. <laughs> uh, um, but 
Also, don't don't forget about those kind of who are they candidates. I mean, the Andrew Yang um, is likely to be on the, on the debate stage, given what how his fundraising has um, has been going, and it, it's a kind of a collective who, what who. Um, but he probably will be up there with sitting senators, former governors, former congressmen, um, and. Also, Pete but Buttigieg, Buttigieg. Yes. Buttigieg. who Thank will you. be at the club, by the way, next Thursday. <laughs> oh. Get uh, all the plugs in here. Like, <laughs> like chicken, like chicken. It means like what? Chickens, the Lord of the Chickens. Oh yes, like that. yes, yeah. yeah. That's what his name means. Yeah, Maltese. Um, it, he had. Wait, a fan- I'm sorry. What? <laughs> apparently, it, I had to interrupt. But wait, but what? Did, what did you just say? Apparently, his name is Maltese for like Lord of the Chickens or so, something like that, right? <laughs> Egg farmer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I would go with Lord of yeah. the Chickens. Okay. I'd, I'd name my campaign bus Lord of the right. Chickens. I'd take it against Devin Nunez's cow straight on. But he had oh an, God, uh, an amazing appearance wow. on the, his CNN town hall yeah. that had Twitter ablaze. And I, and I know Twitter is a very kind of narrow audience. Um, but when you have David, David Axelrod and a lot of other serious insiders saying, wow. Uh, yeah. This guy is someone to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, that can completely reshuffle the cards, and we just don't know. I mean, Iowa is quickly approaching, yeah. and um, and you just don't know what's going to happen. On Wednesday, April 10th, for our next Week to Week program, you can find our Week to Week news quiz on our website. Thanks to our panel today, Carson Bruno, Melissa Kane, and Barbara Marshman. Thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. Thanks for everyone listening and watching online. Have a great rest of your week.